course, in doing so, it uses up a lot of energy. So when a baby's born, if the environment is cold, and babies, of course, are very prone to losing their body temperature, the brown adipose tissue will start metabolising rapidly and produce quite a lot of heat, the prime function of brown adipose tissue. Now, as we get older, we lose the activity of the brown adipose tissue. So in childhood, if children live in a cold environment, the thermogenesis from brown adipose tissue can perhaps double their heat production. It can increase it by 100%. In adults, the mechanism still does work to a degree, although in adults, the brown adipose tissue is much less active than in children. And in adults, it probably only contributes 10 or 15%, uh, makes up a 10 or 15% increase in, in non-shivering thermogenesis when we're exposed to cold environments. But there's definitely a, a factor there in adults. Now, brown adipose cells have numerous small vacuoles containing fat, and they have numerous large mitochondria. So you can see there in the cell, if you've got the vacuoles containing the fat, that is the fuel, the metabolic substrate, and the mitochondria are able to produce heat energy from using the fat. So they have fat and they have mitochondria all in one cells, all in one cell to make it a thermogenic tissue. And the brown adipose tissue is stimulated by activity of the sympathetic nervous system. So a very important mechanism in children, a less important mechanism in adults. Now, in addition to gaining heat from its own metabolic processes, the body can also gain heat from the environment. So obviously, especially if it's a warm day, there's going to be a lot of infrared radiation from the sun, and that's going to warm us up. If the environment round about us is warm, the warm bodies round about us will also radiate heat, and that will help to warm us up as well. So we do have some heat gains from the environment, especially from warm environments. Another place we can get heat gain from is hot food and drinks. So when we drink a hot cup of tea or eat some hot food, then that contains heat which is going into the body and, and that will also warm us up. So we can also have heat gains from the environment as well as heat gains as a result of metabolic processes. Now, in addition to getting heat from the outside and generating its own heat, the body needs to be able to retain heat as well. And what we're looking at here is a section of the skin. You can probably see the epidermis on top here, sweat glands. But notice here that there's a large area of yellow material. This is the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So underneath the skin, the epidermis and the dermis, there is a layer of subcutaneous adipose tissue. Now this layer varies in thickness depending on the part of the body and of course, of course it also varies in thickness between individuals. People that are more obese will often have a thicker layer of subcutaneous adipose tissue than people that are thin. In addition to this, women tend to store more fat subcutaneously whereas men often store excess fat in the abdomen. But the key thing to notice here is that subcutaneous fat, in fact all fat, is a very good insulator of heat. So this keeps heat in the body and stops it being lost through the surface of the skin. To, to a large extent, it is a good insulator of heat. Now, most heat is lost through the surface of the body. So body mass is also going to determine the amount of heat that is lost. Bodies with large mass have actually got more heat in them. So it will take longer for them to cool down. Bodies with small mass, because there is less matter containing heat, are going to contain less heat so it can cool down more quickly. Now what this means is that adults will only lose heat relatively slowly, 
whereas children can lose heat relatively quickly. This is because of the amount of body mass. But there's another key factor here, and that is surface area to volume ratio. Now, given that heat is lost from the surface of the body, the more surface area there is relative to the amount of mass there is in the body, the more heat will be lost. Now, I want to illustrate this with some books. So if we take one book here, we could work out its surface area. It would be that surface, that surface, that surface, that surface, that surface, and of course, and of course this surface. So the book has a particular volume, and it has a particular surface area. But if we increase the size of the body by putting on, in this case, another book, then this surface area and this surface area are no longer exposed to the outside, so they will no longer lose heat. So what we have here is a larger volume of body mass, and that is going to give us a proportionally smaller surface area. So with a small body, the surface area to volume ratio will be large. That is, there will be a large surface area to a small volume. But with a body of greater volume, the surface area to volume ratio will be relatively smaller. There will be a relatively smaller surface area. So if we have a large body, as in the case of an adult here, then there's a relatively large volume but a relatively, a relatively small surface area. So children will have a large surface area to volume ratio. Adults will have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. Now as you increase the linear dimensions, you actually increase the surface area by a factor of four. So if you double the size linearly, you increase the surface area by a factor of four. But if you double the size in a linear dimension again, you actually increase the volume by a factor of 8. So small bodies have a large surface area to volume ratio. Larger bodies have a small surface area to volume ratio. So there's some important clinical applications here in caring for children. One is that they will lose body heat very quickly in cold environments. And as we'll see later, this is especially the case if the child is wet for whatever reason. Especially very young babies, neonates, are very prone to hypothermia, despite the fact that they have the brown adipose tissue to generate the non-shivering thermogenesis. So as soon as babies are born, that's why we always wrap them up quickly, put them next to the mother's body to keep them warm. So children can lose heat quickly because of their relatively large surface area to volume ratio. And because children have a small mass, they can also gain heat very quickly. Now, sometimes when you're caring for children with infections, they can develop pyrexias, of course. And you can take the temperature and find it, say, 37.5 or 38. A bit hot, but maybe nothing to get too worried about. And in an adult, for the temperature to rise up to, say, 40 degrees centigrade, very often would take a few hours. But in children, because there's a relatively small mass to warm up, then they can increase their body temperatures very quickly. And you get into a situation where a pyrexia in a child becomes a febrile convulsion threatening pyrexia. When children get too hot, they can have febrile convulsions and their temperatures can warm up very quickly. So be very careful when you're working with children because they can develop potentially dangerous pyrexias very quickly because they have got a relatively small mass and that can warm up relatively quickly. What we need to look at now is the physics of heat so we can understand the physiology which is going to follow. So a little bit on the physics of heat.
Heat, of course, is a form of